everybody on this wonderful spring day, which means finally normal. <laughs> and that's so wonderful. I would like to introduce you to a workshop, or more like a lecture on paper, and the paper expert in the area, in nationally, but particularly in this area here, is Ed Brickler. He is currently the director of the Kensen Art Education Program at Kensen, and represent Kensen Art and Royal Talents. He's also a working artist and has been art materials consultant for 25 years. His previous employment include McPherson's, Goinor, and Grumbacher. Ed lectures on drawing, painting materials, and methods for art schools all over America and conducts workshops on color mixing, pen and ink, drawing, painting, paper evaluation, and composition. He has published articles in the Artist Magazine, Watercolor Magic, Art Materials Today, Island Arts Magazine, and was the contributing editor for Palette Talk. And he has been acknowledged in more than a dozen art books for his contributions. His formal art education was received at Moravian College in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and Baumschu School of Art in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Ed is currently writing on a book for Northlight on drawing and painting materials and methods. Uh, so uh, let's extend a welcome to Ed Brickler, who is going to start right away. We're going to talk about paper today. I started out as a paper boy. I think I'm going to end as a paper boy. What can I say? It's just the way life goes. You know, sometimes you just can't get away from it. We're going to talk about a lot of different materials today because when I was going to art school, it was very, very frustrating uh, because I went in as an adult. I was in engineering for 13 years, going to engineering school, and decided I don't want to do that anymore because I always wanted to be an artist. So I went back to art school, and nobody could tell me anything. It was frustrating. So I, being that inquisitive mind, I said, I'm going to figure this out. So I went to work for a company called Cohenor, and one day they bought a paint company called Grumbacher. And my boss said, what do you know about paint? I go, well, I went to art school. He says, good, you're in charge of paint. <laughs> That's how it started. I ended up being in charge of paint and paper and everything else because they all work together. A lot of times we take for granted the surface we're working on. We figure, oh, it's just the surface. But it really is the foundation to what we're working on. If the painting's going to fail, if the drawing's going to fail, it's usually because of what we started with and the materials that go on top. So there's ways of evaluating, very simply, uh, and we're gonna, I'm going to impart those tools to you. These are things that I developed, I learned over the years, and, and why they work. Okay? We're going to talk about a lot of different surfaces from regular basic paper all the way through to digital to inkjet papers. Now, one of the things about our company, just a little bit, we're in South Hadley. That's where our, our office and our conversion facilities are. But we started making paper at Arsh in 1492. So we've been making paper for a little while, uh, a few hundred years, 500 plus. Uh, and Canson started making paper in 1557. So we've been around. And it just kind of blows my mind to think that we started making paper before Leonardo da Vinci painted The Last Supper. That's going back a few. So uh, now, one of the things that we think about is paper was not made for artists. Okay, It was actually made the first time we started actually making paper. And paper was made, uh, handmade papers, up, a, up until a few hundred years ago as a, as a major manufacturing process. Uh, today, there's still a lot of handmade paper being made, but it's more of an art in itself. Okay, uh, Twin Rocker is really the only commercial. Uh, they're in Indiana. I live about an hour, two hours from them. I go visit them all the time. They're the only really commercial handmade paper house. They still sell commercially. The rest of them are mostly boutique and, and what I call boutique or workshops where people come in and make their own. Um, I said paper was made for printing and for, um, for writing. And of course, 500 years ago, the only people that were able to do that were mostly the government, the church, and the aristocracy. And of course, as they employed more people, they learned, and of course, then the printing press was developed, and everything took off. In fact, in the early history of Arsh, most of that paper was used for printing. In fact, at one point, Napoleon, um, being Napoleon, took over the Arsh mill 
and basically had him make two million sheets of paper so he could print a print for the conquest of Egypt. And of course, being Napoleon, he never paid for it, so it almost drove the company into bankruptcy. But that's history, and that's the way it usually goes. Now, we make paper out of a variety of materials, and you can make, today we see all kinds of materials. They're trying to make paper. Um, they've made paper out of corn husks and uh, all the way through. Now, most early paper was indigenous. The, the product that was used, the pulp, was indigenous to the area where the paper was made. So, for instance, in Europe, there was no cotton paper because they didn't make, they didn't grow cotton. They grew flax, linen. And so it was the flax that they was used to make paper. The Persians, the Middle East, they used the cotton. You talk about Turkish cotton there. Uh, the Chinese used cotton. But they also used a variety of other materials. How many people have heard of rice paper? Do we make paper out of rice? No. No. There is no such thing as rice paper. It wouldn't hold together. I mean, it, rice plants are kind of flimsy. They have no substance to them. Uh, what they're really using is the bark off of yellow mulberry trees and other indigenous uh, uh, plants that work. We started using uh, back, way back, uh, several hundred years ago, esparta fiber. It grows along the Mediterranean. It's a reed. And they found that if they strip the outer part off, the inner part, they can actually use that to strengthen paper. Bamboo. They try to make lots of different bamboo papers today. Makes a very brittle paper, unfortunately. Um, hemp. We think it's cool to have hemp paper today. Did it 300 years ago. In fact, the first tracing paper was made from hemp. Why? Because there was lots of ships and lots of discarded ropes. Because everything that was made was pretty much made from recycled materials. So we aren't new to recycling. We've been recycling materials for hundreds of years. Uh, when you were of age, you got a set of clothes. And you hopefully didn't grow out of them. <laughs> if you did, you got a new set. But they started out with white clothes. And then they started dying and when they got dirty. And you couldn't get them white enough. And then pretty soon they got dark enough to where they were black. And then it was time to give them up. Because you would die. And that's why people were buried with black clothes. So the story goes. But they would take all the cloth, all the rags, everything they could find, and they would gather them together. One of the worst jobs in Europe during the, uh, the period of time we make paper was to be the rag picker. Because you know where they picked most of them? At the hospital, at the dispensaries, where there were sick people. And of course, what happened is when they collected these rags, they got sick themselves. So it was a, a not a good job. But uh, it didn't end up transitioning into the paper, luckily. <laughs> so people didn't get sick of writing. We did get sick of doing homework at one time, but not of writing. So today we make papers. We've kind of limited down. We still use a variety, but for the most part, it's cellulose fiber. The cellulose fiber is basically the bones of the plant. That's what makes it stand upright. It has a lot of acid in it in most cases, except for certain things like cotton, which is almost acid-free in its existence. But uh, we use these cellulose fibers, and they all vary. Cotton is long and supple, very soft. And uh, in fact, this is what a cotton linter looks like when we, when we get it. This actually comes from, uh, we, when I say we, I'm talking about cancer, we actually get all our, our cotton from Tennessee, from the States. So we've been importing cotton to Europe for almost 200 years. In fact, they almost went into the Civil War the Confederacy because they couldn't get cotton. But they had Napoleon, and so they had their own problems, and it never happened. Um, you know, I think I always kind of tease them that they would have lost more quicker uh, down there. But this is a linter. This is not the fuzzy little cotton ball that we find on the plants. What this is is really what we call the seed fiber. It's actually the fiber that's left inside the pod after the cotton gin pulls out the, the wad of cotton. If we use that wad of cotton, it would be great because that would be really, really strong paper. But do we really need strong paper? Not necessarily. Even cotton sometimes is overkill. What this is is that seed fiber, and they're compressed together. It just makes an easy way to ship it. But this is what we call a linter. If you start playing with the edge here, you'll see it starts fraying very easily. If I put this in water, the thing puffs up like a big sponge and then falls apart. So literally millions of these... A million tons of those are pulled together and 
uh, sent out. I'm going to pass these around so you can touch and feel all these things that I'm, I'm talking about. But uh, we also use wood fiber, and that's what we call alpha cellulose, because in wood fiber, there's a lot of acid. So we have to pull that acid out, and that's why it's called alpha cellulose. That means it has no acid. It's pulled out. It's buffered. If you have a cardboard box, it's probably gamma cellulose. That means it still has the acid in it. So we use a variety of different cellulose fibers to make a variety of papers. Um, so it depends on the quality of the paper as we're working. Sometimes manufacturers will put in a lot of clay. You can always tell a good sheet of paper uh, if you hold it up to the light and you look for a, a real nice consistency of, of material. If you hold it up and there's really dense spots, and then light spots and dense spots and light spots, that's not good sheet formation. What that means is the paper can actually pull apart. It wouldn't be good for watercolor. It wouldn't hold up to a lot of erasing. Uh, so it, it just wouldn't work as well. Uh, a lot of other materials are put in. We sometimes add clay, and clay in a paper basically uh, is used to make it smooth, but it's also sometimes in there as a filler. So we don't like to just put it in arbitrarily. If we're making Bristol, we're making illustration type papers, or we need that extra smoothness, then a clay material, kaolin clay, is added in there. Uh, we also add in a material that buffers it. When you buffer the material, uh, the paper, for instance, when you buy paper, it's acid free. All, all art papers today are acid free except for two that I know. One is newsprint. Newsprint is not acid free. There's also other papers called bogus paper. What they look like is the brown paper bag type, uh, the wrapping paper that the art stores always roll your paper up in. Uh, as soon as you get home, take that off. Don't leave, don't use that brown paper because there's acid in there and that will migrate into your acid-free paper over a period of time. So you want to get rid of that. Uh, so to prevent that, we call it buffering. And what we use is tones. Well, not really tones. We put flavor in. We use calcium carbonate. How many people have ever taken tones? <laughs> Why? We take it for acid and digest it. So what we do is we put the, acid, the buffering agent in here so the paper doesn't bellyache right from the beginning. Okay, no belly aching on the paper side. But the problem with that is, is that when you receive that paper, it's acid free, but it depends on how you use it and how you store it and how you frame it as to whether it's gonna stay acid free. Because calcium carbonate does not last. It breaks down over a period of time and then acid can migrate in. That's why when we go to museums, we go to an art museum, we look at uh, prints, and I'm from Chicago, by the way, uh, so I go to the Art Institute all the time, we get great showing, drawing shows and things there. And there was a recent show and it showed Matisse's uh, prints, and the reason I like Matisse and, those, and all those guys because they used our paper, um, which is very nice. And I always say, well, you know, if it's good enough for Degas, I guess it was good enough for me, or if it's good enough for Matisse, it's good enough for me. But um, I saw this Matisse print, and it had been reframed because it was float mounted in, inside the frame. But the whole aura, uh, the whole outside of the, the print itself, going around, was yellow, really darker yellow than the rest of the paper. Now, yes, the paper is going to yellow over a period of time because of the acid, but it was just this extreme amount, and it was all looked like somebody had chewed on it, and that was from the framing. The paper was up against the wood frame. The acid migrated from the frame into the, into the paper itself. They could stop it, they could slow it down, in some cases they can't, but they could slow it down to a certain degree, but if you can't reverse it. You can't change that and make it new again. Because what acid or its oxidation, its, its analogy is dry leaves. The leaves fall off the tree, they're green, they hit the ground, they then oxidize, they turn brown, they get brittle, they turn to dust. That's what acid does. And guess what? We are made up of a lot of amino acids. We even take them. Flax seed oil, lots of acid here. Omega-6, omega-3, omega-9. You know, we take that. It's part of what the system, as I call it. It's just part of what it is. But when we're, so when we're working with paper, we're really fighting nature. We're really going against the natural laws. And so it's a fight in a lot of cases. Now, 
So we put buffering agents in, we put other ingredients in. In fact, I was just reading a research paper that was written back in the 70s and um, talking about oriental papers, I, I met a lady that's a ninth generation paper maker. So her family has been making paper since like 1,000. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and you know what their biggest concern was with paper? Will the bugs eat it? And you never think about that today. We don't think about, will the bugs get to it? But when you didn't have central heating and you didn't have good storage, you know, and the bugs could really eat away at paper. And they do. So we really, but we don't really think about it. We do put ingredients in to keep the bugs away from it. We don't want them to like it. Um, but you still have to be careful when you're storing amounts of paper because silverfish will get in there and cause a lot of problems. The most important, besides the pulp, the most important ingredient they put into paper, and if you learn anything else today, this is the one item. What do you think it is? Water. No, nah, size. Did you hear my lecture before? No. <laughs> oh, you took paper making. I remember Good for you. That's good. That's perfect, because that's what it is. People don't tell you that. I mean, how many people heard of sizing before? Yeah, we hear about it. Do we know what it does? Yeah, it holds the fibers together. But more importantly is it allows the paper, if you don't put enough in, it absorbs. The paper will absorb. The pulp absorbs the your medium. If we put a middle amount in, then it's only going to absorb half. If we put a lot of sizing on, nothing goes in. And so it's what really makes the paper work for us. Okay, now when we make paper, we make three basic types. We make printmaking papers, watercolor papers, and drawing papers. Drawing papers is a broad range. That goes from sketch to tracing to vellums to on and on. And we're going to go through a lot of those. But uh, in sizing, we put sizing into the paper. We call that internal sizing. We then put paper on top, or put more sizing on top of the paper. When it's finished, we call that external sizing. Simple. Those are the terms you're going to hear. You don't hear much about, well, how much is in there? It's one of those characteristics you can't see, and if it's out of sight, it's out of mind, as I call it. So here's a method of testing for sizing. We have three papers here. We take a watercolor wash and put it on top of the paper. The same blue is used on all three of these papers. There is a difference in the value of that blue. Here. Forget the blue dots. You're not seeing things. That, it really happened. Okay. Uh, actually, somebody was showing me a marker that exploded. <laughs> I was like, oh, great. I'm going to buy that marker real fast. <laughs> Run to the store and get one. Exploding markers. Here, we have a, basically a blotter. This is what we call a water leaf. This is paper that has virtually very, very little size in it. It's almost about the same as that linter. As an sizing that if I do soak it, it's not going to fall apart. So we call this a water leaf. Here's another printmaking paper that has a minimal amount of sizing. Then we have this one, which has a little more. In fact, there's um, this one, which has even more sizing. Now, I show these as printmaking papers because why? We're artists. Do we pay attention to what paper is used for? No. And we shouldn't. We never be pigeonholed into knowing why or what paper is there. We take it because of other characteristics. It feels good. It looks good. Does it work with the medium? Nah, next paper. We just go on. But you can actually evaluate and save yourself a lot of time and effort. And I can tell you a lot of horror stories. Like the time I went to France, my first trip to France, I'm in Monet's garden. I'm painting away while I got paper and I took it along. I was going to do some watercolors. I figured, why not? You know, that's a good place to to try watercolors for the first time? No, not really. <laughs> but I took this paper, and I never tried it before I got there. And it was heavy. It was supposed to be 400 pound watercolor paper. What it turned out was to be like 400 pound printmaking paper. Worked a whole different way. I put a lot of water on, and it just went <laughs> It wouldn't, I couldn't flow color, I couldn't do anything on it. So I had to change my ways of doing things. Uh, did it destroy the trip? No. Well, I wanted it to the first day. I was like, so live it. But it's evaluating that paper, knowing what it's going to do. So before you go on a trip, test your materials, please. 
Uh, it's happened a couple times to me. I should know better. I mean, I teach this stuff, but it's like you just, oh, well, I guess I'll experiment. We'll try something new. But here we have, and how to test, how to, with this watercolor, you mix up some watercolor, and basically I use a sedimentary color like cobalt blue because I get it for free. Uh, but you really want to use uh, a earth color. It's much more affordable. Mix it up in a jar. Have it. Put it I keep the jar in a refrigerator at all times because I'm always testing paper. You swoosh it on. Just take a mop and swoosh it on. I'm going to show you why you just swoosh it on. Because you'll notice all these are pretty smooth. This one here has got blotches. It's called blooming. That means... That sizing is very hard, so the water doesn't sink in, so you don't get a nice smooth wash. And so as it sink, sets on top, the water is just sitting there going doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, drying, the pigment falls down, and so we end up with these swatches. So when you do that on a piece of paper, you know that the sizing is very hard. That's going to be a good paper for colored pencil, for marker, it's going to erase very well. If you have it that sinks in like this, it goes the opposite way, it's not going to work very well. So the lifting test basically is a watercolor correction technique. You wet the brush, rub it on, dab it with a paper towel, and pull it off. It's the first thing I do when someone says, try this paper. I can tell right away what that paper is going to do. How, how well does it lift? Okay. If it doesn't, it's like, well, that's not going to work real well for um, graphite or color pencil because they're going to be actually pushing into the surface. Okay, so... Sizing test is one. The other is an eraser test. Simple. I learned this when I was in grade school. Um, you get that yellow pad of paper, and you get an eraser, an arrow eraser, and a back of your pencil. And when you make a mistake in doing your homework, you erase like crazy, and by before you know it, you get a hole going through the paper. <laughs> Happened to me in college. I was doing a big charcoal drawing, reductive technique, put all the charcoal on, was taking the and we were just giving paper. You know, here, use this. 30 by 40 sheet. And I'm racing away, and it's not coming off. So I go, oh, okay, I was an engineer. What the heck, I'll take a paint pearl. <laughs> then I got a typewriter eraser on top of that. And, I'm, and these are pretty harsh. I mean, I might as well use the sole off my shoe. So I erased, and then I went back over with charcoal. All my marks showed up as these ghost images. I thought I invented modern art. I thought it was still cool because my professor kept saying, make your mark, you gotta make marks, make marks. Well, I made marks. They were just the wrong kind. And he didn't like them. He told me, he said, what is this? I go, that's my marks. He goes, Mr. Brickley, you don't know, you don't have enough experience yet to know the difference between marks and mistakes. 30 year old getting her ego squashed in the ground in front of a bunch of 18 and 19 year old students. Terrible. I still kept on. <laughs> But, so we devised the eraser test. Take erasers on papers, and you're going to get a whole bunch of samples. You see that pile over there on the table? You're going to get a whole bunch of paper to play with. Take erasers. Erase. I found out, in, even in vinyl erasers, you should know, but we don't, there's different um, uh, dexterities to that. So there's really stiff, hard erasers, and there's soft erasers, and they work differently. On here... Top one is a pink pearl, then there's hard vinyl. Next one was soft vinyl, worked the best. Then art gum. Art gums used to be just crumble. They were great. Then people would say, oh, I don't like all the crumbles, so we make them harder. Now they destroy paper. So you get what you want. You know? And then there's the, the infamous needed eraser, which is a great stress reduction thing if you put it in your pocket and walk around all day. But basically, you can even destroy paper with that. Now, on these, I did. I was able to actually destroy, the, ruin the paper. Because when you erase across, if there's not enough sizing, the fibers have a bad hair day. They all stand up on edge. And then when you come across with your medium, it just coats them and makes it darker. Now, I can use that negative as a positive. Because if that happens, I can then take, for instance, a pan pastel, which is very, very soft powder in a pack, it looks like ladies, like a, like a makeup, so don't get them mixed up because it doesn't come off as easy <laughs> as your others. But you could take that pastel and rub it into the paper and create huge toned sheets of paper and then work on top of it with charcoal. 
and use your kneaded eraser to rub. Also, soft papers blend well. If you're working on large drawings, you don't want a paper that doesn't blend if you're taking a stump to it or um, sponges or whatever, or a chamois or a piece of cloth, cotton balls, you know, we use all those different tools. When you're rubbing on that, you want it to smear easily. We find papers that don't work that way. So that's another thing. These are all printmaking papers. Now, why would we even talk about printmaking papers with drawing? Because they come in large sizes. It's the reason why we use printmaking paper. Plus, it feels good. You're going to feel these. These are nice and soft. Um, when we look at evaluating papers, I encourage you to just make your mark. Do the same thing over and over in hopes that you'll reach some point of success. And you will, because what happens is you then have a, a, a basically a way of looking at paper differently. If I work with a graphite pencil and it doesn't erase, I go, okay, that paper doesn't work with graphite, but this one does. Because at some point, you want to try new materials. So I get projects where they hand me a sheet of paper and they say, what will this do? And so this is what I do. I make my mark. I usually, this one actually was a, a several sheet test because this paper has a texture on one side and smooth on the other, so I got to do it twice. I did the watercolor, I did my eraser test, all that. But then I took every medium, different mediums, from gouache to marker, watercolor, graphite, ink, and worked with it. Some watercolor <coughs> pencils I put dry and wet. I want to see what would this do. This happened to be a heavyweight paper. They made it heavy and light, two types, so I did four of those different types of tests. But I worked it over. That's why when you look inside of these little pads, you're going to see a usage chart. That's where the usage chart comes from, from these little tests. It's right on the cover. So we, uh, here I have one here. Those little usage charts that everybody goes by. Um, it was amazing when I first looked at those and I looked at some, they must have been used for many, many years and never changed. And then they look at another paper and they go, well, it's white and it has the same texture. It must work like this one. So they put down, yeah, it works for this material. Not. It has to be evaluated. So that's how they work. Any questions on sizing? Just yes. Not about sizing, but um, like um, prepared, colored, prepared paper in the Renaissance and Broke here, mm -hmm. that was like, Um, it depends. Uh, some of them, uh, the first color papers were actually um, mixed in uh, with the pulp. And it had to do, a lot of times, the coloring agent had to do with what they were working with. So for instance, this is basically what we would call, it's a rendition, but this would be cartridge paper. You know, if you were going to wrap your bullets up in this and your the musket balls and powder and stick it in a gun, it didn't have to be white. Okay, so they wouldn't bleach it out and make it as clean as possible. So you would get papers that were dingy like this. Um, at some point, I'm still trying to pinpoint it, they came out with blue paper. A lot of the blue paper was used for wrapping. But artists would get this and go, ooh, paper. <laughs> you know, we'd start drawing on it. Uh, this is pretty much what a good uh, color of a print paper would be. It could be a little warmer. Um, notice I have the nice visual effects over here, the wear and tear, so it looks like it's 300 years old. It's actually not. But uh, these are actually modern papers that are made to look like old master's papers. But coloring um, wasn't a big factor. In fact, coloring came in not because artists wanted colors. It was actually created prevent forgery. Because if you had a document, say your deed for your property, they could take, especially when bleach was invented, they could bleach out the ink or it was water soluble. They would just take the ink off and change it. I try to keep getting cans on though. Let me do that with my decimal on my check, you know, move it over a couple spots, but it hasn't worked. So what, in fact, Canson was the first, one of the first companies to put color into paper. So they added coloring agents into the paper. And one of the things that uh, they, they just didn't want to put the color over the outside. What they really wanted to do was put the color through it. 
So instead of just dipping the papers, as some people were doing in making paper, they actually put the coloring agent into the pulp when you're making it. So um, that's how we get colored papers today. And a lot of them were analyte, analyte dyes, which would fade. Today, we're using more pigments. And also, some of those dyes, for instance, black paper, up to, oh, probably five, almost five, <coughs> six years ago, um, were not acid-free because of the dye they were putting in. Today, they're acid-free, so they won't uh, affect the other papers in the drawer. Okay, But sizing is very important. It's very important when you're testing. And you're going to see that I'm going to be talking about sizing as we go through. What does the sizing mean? Thank you. I was waiting for somebody to ask that. <laughs> it's usually starch. It could be, there's two types. There's, well, actually, there's three. There's a synthetic called methyl cellulose, which is basically a synthetic cellulose material, uh, which is used in a lot of uh, basic, your notebook papers, things like that, because it's very inexpensive. Basic starch, wheat starch, rice starch, uh, and there's others that they use. That's basically what they'll use in most papers. Uh, but they also use gelatin. When do uh, they take it from potatoes or something? Uh, potatoes wouldn't work as well. I mean, it's starch material. Uh, it's dextrin. But uh, wheat and rice work the best. Okay, they work the best. Uh, gelatin is basically from high glue, which is the original sizing. An old master would take a sheet of old paper, and they would put a sizing on and make it. They would change the... the way the paper worked themselves by putting high glue on. Um, oil paint, they would actually paint on paper and, uh, and I'm going to introduce something later um, near the end, but we would cover the paper with a, a, a gelatin size uh, and basically cure it. They would put the gelatin on and then sometimes even put formaldehyde on as the same way they treat it or canvas. Think of canvas. Canvas was made out of the same material that paper is, except that one's weaved and one's not. Okay. Now, in making paper, we use two types of paper machines. I'll just make a brief mention. One is the uh, cylinder mold machine. We made paper by hand. Think of that, 50 sheets per hour. Okay. They then took, in the, ninth, in the early uh, 1800s, the paper machines were invented because of, of the industrial age and they need it more. So they then took and made, the first one was the, um, the flat screen, which we call the Fortrené machine, um, invented by a Frenchman, patented by the English, hence fake problems. Um, that's always the way it goes uh, in international trade. But uh, what the flat screen was is they actually extruded pulp onto a flat screen and it then run it through rollers and it would create the sheet of paper. Today, that Fortuné machine, we can make 20,000 sheets an hour. So it flies. So when your newsprint and all your notebook paper, toilet paper, um, paper towels, all made on a Fortuné machine. Okay? But for art paper, we slow that down. You have to slow it down if you want good formation. And there's other differences. Then we got the cylinder mold machine. So we took the flat mold, rolled it into a cylinder, and created that. They're 250 sheets an hour, approximately. Now, why does the cotton paper cost so much? One is the cotton. Second is the process. It takes three days to make a cotton sheet of paper. How do we make paper? We make the pulp and then we squeeze it. Well, basically on a paper machine, we run it through a series of rollers. It's got couching, a couching roller which actually pulls it off the the roll, and then it runs through, and they have to air dry the paper, because what happens with cotton? Imagine, starting out 60 inch roll and ended up at 24 at the end. Not very good production that day. So what they do is they basically run it through floor to ceiling, they loop it on rods, and let it go through a room for 24 hours. If you buy heavy paper, 300 pound on up, or even 260 pounds, you're going to notice squish marks in the sheet. Ever wonder what those were from? It's from the clothespins. They still hang it up. I couldn't believe it. So I said, give me one of those clothespins. I brought one home. Patrick was with me. By the way, this is Patrick, our representative here from Kansan, covers the, the New England and half the Atlantic states. 
but uh, we were in, in uh, Arsh together, and they gave us these big clothespins. First thing I did is come home and put it on a piece of paper. I want to see if it fit in that little mark, and it did. So they still hold, hang that stuff up to air dry. It's the only way you can get it to dry. Okay. It does. It does. And that's why in watercolor, one of the things about uh, gelatin sizing, why it's still used, is that all sizing is water soluble. So that means when we soak the paper, as a printmaker would do, we pull sizing out. Um, watercolors sometimes think, oh, let's soak the paper. More the merrier. Well, you just took $2.50 out of that $8. It goes down the drain because it's water soluble. So the sizing comes out. And then when you put your watercolor on, it doesn't look good. And we can't lift anymore. And so when you do stretch watercolor paper, it's get it wet, get it out. Don't soak it. If you're a printmaker, you're going to do the soaking. So, you know, if the paper is too hard, you got a piece of paper and you say, gee, I really want to use this for, say, a printing process. You're doing monoprints. You need absorption. So basically, you would soak it let it dry, and now you have a more absorbent paper. But gelatin or um, starch comes out of the paper very easily, very quickly. Uh, but gelatin takes longer to come out. So that's why it's used in most cases in watercolor paper. Because what happens? You're, you're putting water with the paint and with your color down. It's watercolor. So you're adding water. And a lot of times people say, well, the sizing broke down. Because all of a sudden it put wash after wash after wash, and all of a sudden it just kind of sinks in. That's the sizing, and a lot of times that's a, a, a starch sizing. It's usually student grade type papers. Shouldn't happen with a good artist sheet of paper. It should hold up, and that's why they use the gelatin there, because it breaks down, um, it dissolves slower, okay, much slower. But uh, so sizing is very important. It makes, like I said at the beginning, it makes the paper work for us. Here's one that's near and dear to our hearts. How many people have inkjet printers at home? And what's the biggest complaint we have about that inkjet printer? Too much ink. But when we go to buy that ink, what kind of paper do we get? We buy the cheapest paper we can get on sale because we think, wow, we're going to save money on the paper if we can't save it on the ink. Wrong. If you take a piece of art paper and print on it, this is meat tents. This is charcoal paper. It has a good amount of sizing in it. But when I'm running through an inkjet printer, I'm saturating that paper with ink. Okay? This is what happens. It, you get that kind of dull print. How would you like to get that kind of print instead? Okay? That's a better paper. In fact, this paper is made for inkjet. You're going to pay twice as much for this one. But I thought about this long and hard. I go, you know what? When I go, I'm going to buy a paper, not that's not recycled, it's not going to be the cheapest. I'm going to buy a paper that is made for inkjet printing and laser combination. Because guess what? It has more sizing. I use that. My emails look better when I print them. My expense reports look brighter. Um, um, and I'm using less ink. I was waiting for Staples to call me and say, you don't come back as often anymore. No, I do, because I just print more now. <laughs> but it's one of the things, you know, when you buy your paper, think about what you're using. Don't use the really cheap, cheap paper, because you're wasting your ink. Okay? Okay, one other characteristic, and this one we can see, the thickness of the paper. Okay? We call it weight. Why? Because um, that's how we get that, or that's how we equate it, anyway. Um, there's two ways of measuring paper, the weight of paper or the thickness. One is, uh, you know, when we say thickness, we'd say, okay, it's going to be, you know, millimeters or centimeters or caliper. You're going to use a caliper and measure it. But no, we measure it by weight. There's a real wrong thing about that. And if I do anything in this lifetime, it's to get them to drop the darn pounds. Because you know what? It doesn't work. Because you know how to get that? They take, I'm going to tell you, they take 500 sheets. 18 by 24 paper. It's a standard size. Or it could be, if it's a metric size, it could be 19 and a quarter by 26 and or 29 and a quarter. Uh, or it could be 30 by 40 or whatever. 22 by 30 standard. 
we weigh 500 of those. If it comes up 90 pounds, it's 90 pound paper. But then we take 522 by 30 sheets and we weigh it, it's 90 pound paper. And you go, wait a second. That's why going to art school as an engineering student was really bad because I didn't make friends very well. I'd go like, that's so contradictory. How can you get that? Well, that's because that's how they've been doing it for a long time. Uh, and it's wrong because you're thinking, you know, it's going to be a different thickness between that 18 by 24 and the 22 by 30. It's going to be a different thickness. And that's what we're, we're worried about. That's what we really want to know about is how thick the paper is. The way to do that is look at the grams per square meter. If you look at your little pad, and you might need my trifocals for this, but right here in the center, because there's three different papers in here, it has a pound weight and then a number with a G behind it. That means grams per square meter. Um, how we get that is we take a square of the paper and weigh 500. Now we're talking apples to apples. We got squares, not different size rectangles and we weigh 500. If it comes up 185 grams, it's always going to be this thick. 300 grams, 640 grams, all the way down or all the way up. We pass that to 850 grams. It'll always be that thickness. It's really, uh, it really throws you off when you're looking at pads because you don't know what the manufacturer cut that sheet out of. So, and I had professors, so I, I was down at Purdue, and I, they spec'd a certain size paper, I'll be right with you, yeah. certain size paper, and um, I brought it in in a kit, and she goes, oh no, it's got to be at least 70 or 80 pounds, and I said, well, it is, because it was marked a different number, it was less than that, and I said, it is the same, no, oh, it's not, Look at it. It says it right there. I go, no. I said, look at the number below it. And then that's how I started looking into weights of paper. And sure enough, the paper that was marked at, say, 70 pounds was really as heavy as the 80 pound. It wasn't the same as the 80 pound paper. It's just that it was cut out of a different size sheet. Because the grams per square meter were exactly the same. I got the business. Yes, ma'am. Is there a formula that will equate the pounds to the not accurately. It's better to just, let's wipe the pounds off. And you'll notice on pads that before grams was in little print and pounds was big. Today, they're equal lettering size. It's working. We're getting to the point where we might. Metric system works in that. Yes, sir. Well, I was just wondering about the, for this pad, do you know what 80 pound, what dimension the block would have been at 80 These probably come out of an 18 by 24. So, uh, yeah, but if you go over to our warehouse, right, Patrick? Everything's in big rolls. Yeah. So it's like, you know, depends on how wide it is and how we cut it up to make it work. But in most cases, it's, it goes, they, they take an 18 by 24 because that's standard for drawing. But then watercolor is standard is, is 22 by 30. And printmaking is 22 by 30. Now, those first sheets that I passed around, Notice that they don't say pounds on there anywhere. Those printmaking sheets all say grams per square meter. Doesn't on have anything to do with the French papers? No. Really? No. No. That's because the printmakers use the grams because they are they're pretty smart people. They know their paper. How many printmakers do we have here? See. <laughs> That's why it's grams. Because you know how thick it is because you're going to set up your press. So you have to know how thick that paper is to start. If it was in pounds, printmakers would be very upset because it wouldn't work. So, so dispel the pounds. Go with grams per square meter. Join the advocacy. <laughs> Another thing that um, we look for in paper is texture. This is something we can feel. Um, it's used for, by different mediums, for different mediums, okay? So texture is really, and it's personal. Sometimes we like, you know, a really heavy textured paper, and other times we wanted something nice and smooth. When I started, when I worked with Covenor, it was with pen and ink. I worked with 4XO over pedograph pens. We never, I would never choose a paper with texture because it would clog the pen, okay? Or a soft paper. I didn't even know about sizing then. Had I known about sizing, I would have been even more of a hit. Um, because I rewrote the instructions on Rapidograph. You never shake the pen. 
If you never shake the pen, you never have a problem. How many people ever use the rapidograph? They're going, I still have nightmares about that sucker. <laughs> um, I just did the demos for my book last summer with the rapidograph pen. That pen still has ink in it and it still works. Okay, so it works, it works, it works. But we use smooth papers because you're working with a metal nib. Today we're lucky to get all these crazy fiber tips and markers. We can any surface we want. So it was a little hard for me to kind of go to a textured paper, but you get over it quick. Different textures. How we get texture is basically when the paper's wet, we run it through a series of rollers with felts on them. The felt basically pulls the moisture out of the paper, but it also puts texture in. You have hot pressed papers or smooth bristles that's run through heated rollers that basically presses, presses it down. Um, if you're using really rough paper, you use a felt that's like almost like a burlap. It's very, very rugged. Uh, cold pressed papers, be in between it. Or There's so many terms for texture. You'll see fine tooth, um, medium tooth, heavy tooth, um, rough, cold press, and even cold press. The, think of texture as being the fingerprint of the paper. If I take, I can pull out eight cold pressed papers, they're all different. Because every manufacturer has a different felt. And they have a different specification for what cold press is to them. So when you go online and you buy a paper and you go like, oh, I'm going to get some cold press, they get it and they go like, this isn't cold press. Because you couldn't see it, you couldn't feel it. So you need to really see paper and know which, what, what is what. And that's another reason why you want to collect swatch books and collect samples. So you have basically a repertoire of paper samples that you can pick from and choose. Um, notice again, here's the hot press versus the, the cold press. <laughs> notice the blotching on there. That's because when those heated rollers go over that sizing and it's gelatin, what it does is it basically hardens that sizing. And so this would be a lot less absorbent than a cold press. I have people call all the time, what's wrong with your hot press paper? It doesn't work the same as cold press. You have another question? <laughs> it's what I want to say, but it's like, no, there's a reason. It's because of the rollers. It's going to work differently. It's harder sized. So sizing, again, another, another uh, example of it. You're going to see, when you go through papers, a variety of textures. Um, the laid finish. When you made paper, there was two types of screens. There was a laid screen, which was a series of copper wires really close together, and then stringer wires, which were a heavier gauge, and they would hold them all together. And that was one screen. So if you see in a museum on laid paper, there isn't a laid screen. If it's on mo a woven paper, then it's like the screen off your window. It's little squares. Okay? And uh, so those are the two types of screens. Well, one day at our mill, one of the arch mills, uh, Ang, Dominique Ang, came in and said, I need a paper to do Conte drawings. I want lots of surface, lots of surface. So they experimented with a bunch of stuff. And one of the mill rights grabbed the screen and actually had the paper sitting there with, and didn't take it out of the mold. And when he took it out of the mold, he saw this lines and he said, that's what I want. And so what they did is they then took the screen, went down through the paper machine and put it around some rollers. So as the paper came through, they created the laid finish. So that's why when you look at Dominique Ang, Seurat, all the French, a lot of French artists, you can see that laid finish. Why? You know, we use it today for a variety. Some people, it's a love-hate relationship with this, this one. People like it. They don't like the mechanical part of it. It looks mechanical. But back then, it was like, it was texture. Um, Turner did the same thing. Turner would go to the paper uh, houses, and he would grab a stack of paper, and he would flip it over, and he would look at it. Because the, when you're making mold paper, the felt side is finished paper and the bottom of the wire side is, can be really gnarly. He worked on the gnarly side. That's why it's very hard to forge a turner because his papers were so all over the place. Did he care? Nah. People today would never use that. It has to be the same sheet every single time. 
Uh, but not for him. He didn't care. He just worked on it. But he would bound, have papers bound, uh, and make his own sketchbooks, make his own uh, pads from that. Other textures on paper, dual surface. Paper has two sides. You ever figure, why do they only put texture on one side? What's wrong with the, broad, the other side? You know, it's perfectly a good sheet of paper over there. Well, when you start making paper machine, by machine, you can do that. So heavy texture on one side, OK? This texture was put on um, kind of after the, the Ang paper was so that it would give pastel artists uh, a lot of surface to work with. Because the more surface you have, the more medium you can put on. I can put a lot of charcoal and a lot of pastel on here. This will take something like 25 to 30 layers of pastel, and you can still write on it. Otherwise, if it's smooth, you're just pushing dust around. Okay, but then the back side, or the reverse side, is nice and smooth. I always have to watch that, the smooth back sides of, um, of paper. I've had kids in class just giggle, and I'm going like, what's going on? I'm talking about paper. And they just, you don't know what you said. You said smooth backside. <laughs> and I go, okay, <laughs> next, and we went on. But smooth side can be used for colored pencil, for graphite, for ink, for a variety of other things. So you have ch choices. So with Canson, we started doing is making a lot of dual surface papers. We make like 12 of them, 12 different papers. Um, another paper. This one here is a printmaking paper, but uh, makes a great drawing paper, block print. Okay, it's got to hold up to the rigors of pressing a block or a matrix into it. That's one of the nice things about cotton. So this is 100% cotton. Uh, what two with papers, when you see the paper, if it's going to have cotton in it, it's going to say so. That's bragging rights. If it's mold made, it's going to say so. If it doesn't say anything, then you know it's machine made and it's alpha cellulose. If it's like one of the papers here, I think it says 55% cotton, it says 55% cotton. You know, the rest of it is smoke and mirrors. No, <laughs> it's actually the alpha cellulose that's added to it. And what's unique is that that same paper uh, going back in the early 1900s was 100% cotton. But as cotton prices kept going up, it became unaffordable. So you have to then start looking at it. Now, did we really need cotton in there? No, not really. You don't really need cotton in there. Cotton is nice, soft, but when you're putting all that sizing in, it's like, why well, have it? You don't need it. Um, I saw a layout paper, 100% rag layout paper. It's like, it's like having 100% rag gift wrap. You don't need it. It's because you're putting marker on it. Marker's going to go through everything. So sometimes you need it, sometimes you don't. So you really have to kind of look at it. But we get these buzzwords that we need that, and that's what we have to have. Um, what's nice about this paper? Dual surface. You can work on either side. One is textured. This one here. That's well, nice for charcoal, variety of materials. Um, and over here we have a smooth side. So you have, and what's nice about the paper like this, it comes 50 inches wide. So you can make some. It's Canson edition. It's, and what's also, in the, in the reason that was made in the first place, is for printmaking. Students and ask about the printmaking. Students have to run their proofs and then they have to run their series. When you're paying huge amounts for paper, it's like, I don't want to print. That's half the price because it's machine made versus mold made. Okay, so you can get away with going with a different process of making it and bringing the price down. And so that's actually why that paper was made. And um, so a lot of students, a lot of artists, I mean, because there isn't, a lot of difference. It's cotton. It works. It's going to be able to press into it. It's not going to ruin the paper. Tracing paper. We invented tracing paper 200 years ago. When we first mill will make it, basically you take the fiber and you keep pressing it through rollers and keep pressing it and pressing it until it gets very, very thin. No, we don't make it out of onion skins. Um, it's actually made, was made from hemp. And then when the hemp went away, we said, okay, we'll use alpha cellulose. It works just, a, just as fine. Um, but there's a big difference in here. This is the, the paper we make. This is what you'll find, what they call tracing paper. You can't see through it. It's got too much fiber. It, so it kind of defeats the purpose of it. Another paper, um, and it is a paper, although it is pretty hard, it's called vellum. 
Vellum is a paper that has no sizing in it, and, but it has a resin. It's actually a resin coated paper. And what we do is we put the resin on it, it then turns it transparent so we can see through it. Okay? What's nice about uh, resin coated paper is that we can work front and back. The blue is on the back. Burnt sienna is on the front. So I can actually work on both sides. I could do colors on the back. I could do inking, graphite on the front. I can do layers of this. Um, it's used in a variety of applications. I was first introduced to this when I did drafting. I did a lot of engineering drawings on this stuff uh, because it's, it's ink receptive, as we call it. So it works great for graphite. Yes? Sorry to interrupt, but That's okay. what about wet medium on trees and vellum, essentially, like the stuff? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. But oh, I'm going to give you a couple different hints on how to work with it. You can run it through an inkjet printer. So positive for silk screen, but put a carrier sheet on. Because the first time I made one of these, I ran it through my inkjet machine, and it was like in there, rolled up, going around in circles, and the ink was like going all over the place. Um, kind of made, made a really interesting print, but uh, you want to put a carrier sheet on it because it does get wet. It's going to scroll for you. Uh, what is interesting, though, when you do wet it, and I've used this for collage, collography and collage. Uh, when you wet it, it becomes very silky. And you can form it and shape it and then let it dry. And it'll take that shape because it goes back to the brittle itself. You're talking about tracing paper? No, this is vellum. No. Vellum. Tracing paper will fall apart. It's just basic paper. But vellum uh, will hold the shape. The first time I, I, I was like, what does resin do? You know, does it work like sizing? So I wet it, smushed it, tore it, crumbled it up, left it sit there. When I came back, I had this wad of vellum, hard. So I took it and I said, okay, take my water bottle, shape it around it, let it dry. It was able to sculpt mold with it. So I was able, but then I get into doing some mixed media pieces. I could do an inkjet print, then scrunch it all together and distort the shapes. You could also, this comes double thick, so you can actually cut uh, stenciling out of it. So it wide variety of, of applications when it comes to vellum. Uh, you can stain it with color. I've, I then roll over this with a brayer with, with transparent acrylics, create my own uh, colored vellum. You could take some iridescent medium and put it on. You now have iridescent, fluorescent, all kinds of crazy papers. And they actually sell those, but you can actually make them yourself if you don't have it. So a, a, a lot of different applications for this type. Now, there was one really inventive um, product that came out of vellum, uh, and it's been around for 300 years. It was called vellum because it had the same texture as true vellum. Okay, vellum is actually a texture. It's not a, it's supposed to be the name of a paper, but it ended up being that. Who knows what that was used for? Go back in French history. It was used for map making, but one more important thing, it's actually on the logo of Canson logo. It's the Montgolfier, which is French for hot air balloon. We invented the hot air balloon, made with that material. Shaped layers and layers over it over the top and then put air in it and off it goes. It was the first hot air balloon. So when you look up the French word for hot air, for airship, hot air balloon, it is Montgolfier who was the owners, the original owners of the Canson Mills. So it's just a little history. Yes? yes. A while ago I wanted to print on vellum mm -hmm. and I was told not such, probably not going to work because it's not going to absorb the ink and printmaking Right. Are, yeah. So, is there a workaround? Not really. It is too hard for printmaking because if you wet it and you press down it, it's probably going to tear. It will tear because it, when it gets wet, you can yeah. tear it very easily. And if you print it dry, it's just not going to... Right. It's not gonna, but see, with an inkjet print, it works, and it helps in doing silkscreen. Or you can create your collography, your, your, basically your collage that you can print from. That's where it's used. It's used more as a medium in that case rather than as a, as a final product. 
I mean, there's people that have done uh, letterpress, some letterpress on it, have tried that uh, with some success. Uh, down at Purdue, where they, they have their own, as most universities do, they have their own printing, uh, where they would print their catalogs. And uh, in the design classes, they were looking at traditional art papers in that. And so we had sent a whole bunch down, and they ended up doing a lot of stuff with vellum, where they could print on it and use it in, in, in design work. So they use it as overlays. Uh, but printed digitally. But printed digitally, yeah. Yes? Um, where it's folded here, it, and it sticks, it sticks to itself? Mm -hmm. Is that the, is that the yep. resin? Or the yeah, it sticks to itself. Cellulose. Yeah, because, well, what happens is the resin that's on there, gets, it gets really mm -hmm. wet and kind of feels silky, which means that, you know, the resin doesn't come out, but it just gets really silky. And so when you press it, when I wet it, and I scrunch it together, then I, where I overlap it, I take a roller and roll and flatten it out. And that overlap then will stay together because it dries brittle. And when you put it like around the bottle, it holds that shape for the same reason, mm -hmm. that it becomes malleable and then hardens yep. again. Yeah, because when it's wet, it sticks to itself. It's very... It's like hair, it just kind of sticks to itself. But then when it dries, it stays there. You can actually leaf it apart so it doesn't really glue together. I can actually lift up the edges and you can actually cut away on that. If you wanted to remove parts, take an X-Acto knife and just cut parts away. Bristol. Oh, I'm sorry. I have another question about tracing. Yeah. No, it has al it's alpha cellulose. We don't use alpha cellulose, which is tree fiber without the acid. So it's basically, we used, at one time it was hemp, which was used in there, which is very, very uh, hard, very brittle, very hard, because they felt if they were going to make this paper very thin, they needed something that would give it strength. But what they're doing is they're actually rolling the fiber so it flattens. It's almost like taking straw. If you took straw and laid it down and kept wetting it and took a hammer and kept beating it, you would actually beat it into transparency. And basically that's how the tracing paper is made. Glassine is made the same way. Glassine is made, uh, but they don't put the size, they put a, a different type of sizing in than it would in regular paper because uh, you want it to be in what we call inert. And you don't want it, if you're putting two prints together, you don't want it to ever stick. Today, instead of making that nice transparent paper similar to tracing paper, what they're doing is they're actually coating thin paper, which is not good. Because that coating, they don't know, has it been time tested? How is it going to react with that pastel in 50 years? Or with the ink? Or even the paper? Will it change a color? They don't, they don't it, have they done the time test on it? We don't know. Is yes. there a, um, an acid-free glassing? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And also the tracing paper. And the tracing paper. Yeah, all these are archival. I haven't showed you anything that's not archival. I, I, I never showed newsprint because I, I'm a snob. I don't use newsprint. I read it. I read it in the morning and then I get rid of it. What would be the difference between interleaving paper and glassing? Um, a lot of times they're the same, but it depends on how they're made. And uh, I always thought they were all made the same way. And then I found out because there's a difference in price, uh, they're, and it's because of how they're made. Because to make a true glassine, you have to keep rolling it, and that costs more. Or if you just take a sheet of paper and coat it, it's pretty inexpensive, so they can bring it down. So interleafing papers, uh, a lot of times, I think of interleafing papers as, okay, you're going to put it in between. And a lot of times, there's the there's same term. People call it an interleaf, where it's actually made from glassine. So it depends. Just don't put newsprint between your prints. <laughs> and it's and it's easy to do because it's there. And it's like, oh, this is cheap. Put this in between. I had a professor at one school. I mentioned that, and he kind of saw his eyes go wide. He come back the next day after another lecture in his class. He says, I pulled all the newsprint out of my drawings. <laughs> I go, thank you. <laughs> or you're going to be really thanking me in a couple of years. So, did you have a question? No. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, one paper that doesn't have a weight. Bristol. Wow, that's like the first time in like three years I've had somebody actually answer that. Um, kind of go, Bristol. 
How do we get Bristol? Easy. Um, with machine-made paper, with you know, mold-made and machine-made paper, one of the things that happens, because you're making the paper very quickly, you get a more discernible grain. And what grain is, is that the fibers tend to line up. So that when the paper gets wet, what happens? It rolls up. I was telling you about the tracing paper going round and round in my machine. That's because it's machine-made paper. So it rolls up. This, when it rolls, this is the grain is going that direction. You can test paper for grain by bending. If you bend it, you know, and people say, well, it's rectangular. Do a square. <laughs> you can feel the grain in the paper if it's really, and some are really discernible. Some aren't. It's like some you press and you go like, oh, it feels the same. It's probably because it's mold-made paper, and there the fibers are, because we're making it very slowly, are crisscrossed very nicely, very natural. And so that takes the grain away. But if they make it when they're running through the rest of the machine, and a paper machine, has anybody ever seen a paper machine? Yeah. It's huge. You know, we make paper in about the length of this table, and then they do 50 yards to finish it. So they're big, long, long machines. But that process has a tendency of putting grain into paper. Um, yes? Do you actually make paper in South Hadley? No, we just convert there. We get all the stuff that's made in other mills that are other mills. Uh, and then we bring in the big rolls, and there's where we cut up and make pads and sheet stock and rolls, big rolls, things like that. So we do the conversion here. But uh, with the grain, um, it'll roll up. So with machine-made paper, if you were an illustrator back, you know, we, again, we take for granted we got air conditioning. We don't worry about it. We leave our artwork out. Um, I remember when I, in my early years of drawing, drafting, we would, if we didn't cover up your drawing in the morning, you basically had to do it over because the moisture would get on the paper and your drawing would be like this or rolled up. Well, that's what happened with illustration. The graphic artists, illustrators got tired of having their drawings rolled up, so they took two sheets of paper with the grain going this direction, turned one this way, and spliced them together. So now we have two plies. One wants to bend this way, one wants to bend this way, they keep each other flat. So a true Bristol will always have plies, not pounds or grams per square meter. You will find Bristol, because we call that basically student Bristol. It's Bristol, or we call it Bristol paper. What it means is that it's a paper that has the same finish, the vellum, or smooth as a Bristol, but it doesn't, it's not plied together. Okay, it has a, a thickness that's similar. So when you buy Bristol, it's always going to be two-ply, four-ply, six-ply. You don't want odd plies because somebody's going to win. And you don't <laughs> want somebody to win. You want them to be down. So basically, we apply wood technology and paper. Okay? We just take thicker pieces of trees and make it thinner. <laughs> but uh, what's nice about Bristol, and you'll see, very hard sizing on it. Remember the blotchy watercolor test? Very blotchy. So when you're working on, on, on smoother surface like this, Lots of hard sizing. That means when you're putting watercolor down, you have to really control the amount of water you're putting on there. Would this make a good printmaking paper? No, because it's too hard. Okay, you can't print on it. Um, would this work through an inkjet printer? Yeah, because it's a lot hard, a lot of very hard sizing. It'll go through. Great for color pencil, because color pencil you're bearing down. You're adding lots of layers. You're adding alcohol marker over the top of it to seal the wax and then building more layers. So you need a paper that's really going to hold up. Inking, markers, ink renderings, what have you. We talked about marker paper before. Just layout paper. You know, marker goes through everything. One of the things about marker is that it's a solvent and it's lighter than water, so it's going to go through. There's a paper that even Sharpie goes, it won't go through. Okay? Wonderful for doing marker renderings. You know, it works well, has a good tooth to it, it's thin, it's inexpensive, but it works. So you don't have it going through. In fact, they debate this all the time. You'll see paper that says um, smudge proof, uh, bleed proof. What a, what a marketing term that is. Bleed proof, I go, I hold the marker on there. One, two, three, four, five. Pick it up goes through the next sheet, it's not bleed proof. You can't use that term. That's bleed proof. Okay, I can hold the marker in there all day and nothing happens. 
So, and that's another way of testing for sizing. Just take a marker, a Sharpie, and put it on the paper. If the dot grows, you know it has, it's very absorbent. Okay, so therefore, papers are created for special, for illustration or for comic art. Comic art, they use lots of markers. So you want a paper that has a lot of really hard sizing on it, that'll work. Or a paper that works well with acrylic. Acrylic right out of the tube. You put a lot of sizing in. You put that on there, does it wrinkle? This paper is kind of weird because I did a project with it and I thought, oh, this will hold. This will hold. Actually, I actually have the wrong one. It'll hold. <laughs> and when I painted the acrylic on it, it went, Err. and I go, oh, great. I'm going to have to. Now, what I normally do is just wet the back and go flat again. So I thought, oh, I'll come back. I came back. The acrylic was dry. The paper was flat. So what happened is as it dried, it actually flattened itself out. Um, so you, you end up with some really strange things sometimes with certain papers. That's those two. Um, one of the only papers that you can actually work with oil color is what we call canva papers or canvas papers. Basically, it's a paper, but we take and put canvas to create the texture, and they then coat it so that if you put oil color on or oil pastel, it's not going to go through. Um, it takes the place of getting the high glue out and basically sizing your paper with either high glue or casein um, or shellac. Yes? This is too far vellum? Yes, vellum. Vellum is the tech. Remember I said vellum is actually called, is a term for texture? But oh, okay. with the transparent paper, because it had that texture, people start calling it vellum. So sometimes in art, you'll find terms that mean like three, four things. Um, put these aside. Okay, with the, with oil on paper, now you can... We go back to sizing. You can change the sizing on paper depending on what you want to do. For instance, I paint with oils. I'm an oil painter, and I do plein air. So what I did is I would I was I would always take and in fact I remember in art school gessoing cardboard boxes and painting on them sketches because it was like hey it works it's a surface. Um, but you have an illustration board, okay? or a mat board, you grab those. You have to put some gesso on. So normally we're used to white gesso, but today they make a clear gesso. So that means you can see what's under it. So I can actually do a drawing, put a fixative on, put clear gesso on, and actually see the drawing. Now, this is the, what the board would look like, the color. This is with one coat, and then this is two coats. And I started experimenting, I go like, wow, that's a nice pastel surface. Besides just being a painting surface. Um, Sorry, what is, what are you putting on that? Gesso. That's the yeah. clear gesso? Yep, this is clear gesso. So the One board coat. started out being that red. red. Yep. But then I thought, eh, what if I want to do something that's a little brighter? So I took a whiteboard and took the clear gesso, put some burnt sienna, and created it in Primatura. So I can actually get a nice bright background. Then I thought, well, you know, we all, how many people paint in oils? Okay. How many people paint on top of acrylics or work with acrylics? Okay. I could actually do a whole underpainting using clear gesso and acrylic and do all my washes and basically render whatever I want and then paint on it with oils because now I have the same texture as the gesso because it is gesso. So I can actually use that as an underpainting uh, technique. So there's a lot of different options that you have when it comes. Um, uh, an artist friend of mine uses shellac on paper. He takes shellac and coats it with, and he puts some coloring in. Um, he takes some burnt raw sienna watercolor and stick it in the shellac and stain your paper and it looks like you had an old paper. Uh, but he uses, he does red chalk drawings. And so he wants that hard surface so that he gets nice sharp lines. It's not going to eat up the pencil or the chalk. So he modifies it using that. You can get casein uh, powder, and you can actually create a casein sizing. There's actually one that's made. It's called Spectrafix. Lady mixed uh, basically casein with alcohol and water, and you can spray it. It's a pump spray. I use that in my studio all the time. 
uh, because I could spray a fixative and not have to turn the vent fans on or run outside with my, with my gas mask uh, because I could, it's not toxic. I could spray it right there and it works perfect. So that was a sizing that the old bastards used. Another one we have is acrylic, acrylic resin. We take acrylic medium and water, put it on paper, you create a sizing. Okay, you can adjust, adjust uh, your paper for a variety of things. And today there's so many of those different surface of grounds that you can add, um, you know, they got grounds for pastels, they got grounds for this and grounds for that. But, you know, as artists it's like, wow, what happens when we mix these? You know, maybe I don't like that. Add some matte medium into it, water. Tame it down a little bit. So there's a variety of grounds that you can add to change the surface because what we have is not only papers that come in pads, but now there's a lot of different boards. Okay, we used to have illustration boards where you had a, a vellum and a smooth, or a cold press and a smooth, and a watercolor board. Now there's like 12 different textures, 30 different colors, um, a variety of things, even a nice blackboard. So there's a, a whole variety of these that are out there that you can use. Uh, and when you're using boards, yes, it's going to warp. But the easiest thing to do is you take that board, you flip it over, put a wet X across it, it goes flat. If you're using acrylic and you're using really thick stuff on there, I usually put a coat of gesso across the back because that coats it. it. It's reversing the, the roll, okay? If you have a roll of paper, and people buy rolls and they go, what do you do with the last couple feet? Because it's like bone on roll. Put weights on it, spray it with a misting bottle, and it'll go flat. Okay? Does it work? Yeah, because I use it all the time. I do it. In fact, I've had the demos where um, I've done the work on there and let it sit there, and I'll put the wet X, and everybody just kind of watches it. And it goes, boop. Um, when I was writing my book, I was doing the illustrations for it, and that's the photographer says, every time they come in here with boards, they're like this. And I said, well, watch this. So we put an X on it, and she's there, click, 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 <laughs> until it went flat. So she said, wow, she said, I can teach them something now when they come in and working with illustration boards. So um, some new papers. Uh, well, another, not new, because with the pastels, we've always added a lot of texture, so we could put grounds on there. Um, there's sandpaper. It's been out for a long time, which really eats up pastels. But this is a, a pastel paper that has uh, some nice tooth to it. It's basically an acrylic with grit in it, okay? Silk screened onto the sheets. also comes in boards. Can we use it for other things besides pastels? Yeah. Colored pencil works great on it. Doesn't it's, it has enough texture, but it's not going to eat it up. Um, I've done oils on it, oil pastels. Will it go through the paper? No, because it's basically like a gesso, and so it gives us a really nice coating on there. Uh, one of the things that happens uh, today is a lot of pastel artists are doing underpaintings with watercolor and acrylics. Um, a lot of the workshop teachers are doing that because. It saves time. It's like get out there, you know, whip out a watercolor and then start adding pastel to it. So does that work on that surface? Yeah. Did they know it worked on that surface? No, because nobody ever tried it. They thought, oh. Because the, the whole thing when they're making products and marketing is a lot of times they'll say, oh, it's a pastel paper. Only pastelists are going to use it. I go, what? <laughs> what do you mean? And uh, no. We're artists. Never be pigeonholed into using something that has a title. You know, if if uh, if we only sold printmaking paper to printmakers, we probably we go out of business. Uh, but no, drawing people use it. You know, watercolorists. I charcoaled on watercolor paper for many years. Simply why? Because I had it, so I use it. What paper would you recommend for encaustic? Encaustic, actually. I like the, the Canson Edition, the cotton paper. These are all some encaustic monoprint, encaustic monoprint, heavier encaustic, heavier encaustic. Even taking a digital print, oh, I lost it in here. 
digital print and putting an encaustic over the top of it. Will it work? Yes. It's because in inkjet papers are, um, have an ink receptive coating, which means they pull the ink in, dry it real fast. So it's very, abs it's absorbent up to a, a really thin layer, but it pulls it in and, and holds it there. So um, a lot of people are working with, with uh, papers and then mounting them to surfaces. Do we really want, I mean, it's really a no-no to be working on plastic thick on paper because it's flexible. It's supposed to have a rigid surface. But you mount it, you know, at the end, you mount it on there. Yes, sir? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That is golden. I think I have written on there golden, golden. Um, yeah, that's yeah golden. Golden uh, is uh, silver point ground. Yeah, it works real well. It uh, really natural pigments out of uh, Santa Rosa, California. He uh, makes a lot of old world type things. He also has a silver ground that's really good, uh, and also has the silver points that come in long pieces, so you can put them in an old. Uh, pencil uh, lead holder and use them, which is nice. Where's the name again? Uh, natural pigments. He makes them. I like he he comes up with like a 0.3, a 0.5 millimeter full, uh, silver point or copper that you can actually stick into the lead holder and use it, uh, which is is nice. Rather than buying just that little stump <laughs> that comes in the end of a pen holder and you end up wearing it down. Any other questions? Okay, we're almost done. Oh. Um, what would you recommend for a life-size portrait in pastel? Mm -hmm. I've been able to figure that out. Life-size portrait pastel. I would use probably the Canson edition. It's 50 inches wide. Now you're doing life-size portrait, so. Is it board or? No, it's paper. Paper. So then I'd have to mount it. Yes. You can buy, it depends, life-size portrait would be okay, but life-size portrait would be about this big, 22 by 30. Six foot? No, 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 I mean a, a full figure. Oh, full figure? Like six foot. Four. Okay, now we're talking. Yeah. Life-size life drawings. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, actually, the Canson edition works great for that. That's what they're using in most classes, a lot of, because it's 50 inches wide, and it comes in 10-yard rolls. Uh, or you can get 150 yards if you really want to make a big drawing. And then, you mount it on. and then you just basically you're going to mount it uh, onto a board. You're going to do a um, hinge mount, cover, put a however you're going to frame it. But you'll have to hinge mount it, or you can float it. I've had people that mounted them to boards and let them float. So and there's a variety of different if ways. I want of, like a marble dust texture. I can do that on that edition. Mm -hmm. They use it for, I was just over at the factory today and they had sent a print back for me last year and I finally got to see it. It was a steamroller print. And they, uh, they do this down at UMass in Boston. No, Mass College of Art and Design. They do it here too. Do you? Yes. Ah. So anyway, that's what they use. That's what they've been using is the, uh, the Canson Edition. It's nice because it's wide. You can roll it out and go to town on it. So yeah, it's used in a lot of places. It's like one of those papers that can be used in a wide, wide variety of ways. Yes? Where can you get those? You don't have a store outlet where no. you are. No. Patrick, where can they get Canson Edition? Oh, oh. the Guild. Actually. The Guild? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 That, that Guild. <laughs> no, that's a good place. Guild has good, Guild over in Northampton, okay, there you go. And they have a lot of different products over there. I'm, I'm one of those art, art supply junkies. I mean, I go to a store, I always buy something. So guess what, I'm buying something like every other week. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have a question about watercolor paper, which I use with some printing. Mm -hmm. It's because it's paper. So when you wet it, it's going to wrinkle. That's why in watercolors you stretch paper, yeah. unless it's 300 pound on up. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't want to fly it. Is there any other way to get it to stay flat? Not if it's <clears throat> if it's like 140 pound down. No, it's going to always rake them. So, and if I iron it? If you iron it, you can. That'll work. What I do is turn them over, iron it on the backside, mist it, put a cloth down. I put a terry cloth down, and or even what I do is take cotton canvas. Lay a cotton, piece of cotton canvas over it, and I can do the whole thing if it's big. But that'll be the easiest way to flatten them out. Yes. Other questions? Yes, sir. Thinking of flattening, the piece of paper you've got that's got the red and the blue on it, the quarter is lifted up a little bit. It's just lying there. Uh huh. You can see that. Is, it, is there a good way if you've got a, a finished piece to get like just one corner to drop down? Mm, not unless you wet it. <laughs> You can, if you wet it, it'll curl. Because I was, when I did the uh, gessos on that one board, I did that. I put the clear gesso on, I painted the whole part of it, and I left one side that was bare. And then I added the second coat, and then I put the white gesso over the top, and the board went like, whoop, like that. So I had one end that was curled pretty bad, and the other side, it just went like a ski slope. So I could look at it and I go, hmm, that's kind of interesting. I could shape, you know, I could wet this side and make it go this way, wet the board this way, and I can end up with a scroll on the board. So you could actually shape using moisture on that. So if I took the paper, I could wet one end. Just right. And just one corner and, left, yeah. and leave that droop down. And actually, you can actually help it if you press it down around something. Yeah. And kind of hold it there, it'll form. It'll form to that shape. Okay, yes? What is mylar and how much mylar? Mylar is uh, made from plastic, uh, polypropylene, polyurethane plastics with coatings on it. It is very, very durable. Um, used in engineering drawings because it doesn't change in size. So for instance, uh, like at Boeing aircraft, they use it for a lot of uh, airplane drawings, and it's good they do because if they use paper, the paper would probably grow, and then each panel they cut would be a different size. So they actually used the mylar for for that purpose. Uh, we used mylar back in my engineering days because you put it in the drawers, it lasted a long, long time. It's much more durable than uh, paper because it doesn't change. Uh, of course, in case of a nuclear attack and fusion, we don't know well. They'll probably all melt together, and we won't have to worry about it anyway. But uh, under heat, it has some problems. But it doesn't get brittle. And I remember pulling old drawings out of drawers that were done back in the 30s, uh, that and in four, even the 40s and 50s. Um, most of the early ones were cloth, but the later ones were done on, on tracing vellum and and. It was nothing to be pulling a drawing and, whoops, only half the drawing came out because it ripped or it broke right across. With mylar, they would slide right out. So it's really durable. Okay, it Are is a durable. Are you talking about what is also referred to as drafting film? Yes, same thing. Mylar, drafting film. Um, yeah, there's lots of different names for it. Yes. Okay. Something new. Up to this point, you always had to size paper to work in oils. Uh, today you're going to get a sample of a paper that's called oil paper, and it feels just like watercolor paper. It is basically cotton paper, but it has a special sizing that doesn't uh, it basically protects all the fibers from linseed oil from the acid nature. So what you have is something that you can basically do sketches, plein air painting. I went out to the plein air festival. And I took 36 sheets of this with my easel. It was this thick. If I had taken 36 panels, I would have needed an extra suitcase. So it was really nice to travel with. Um, this is a wash that was put on it and just and then wiped out. But I built layers on this. It doesn't come through. Okay, the, we, A bleed test on this is basically done like this, but we usually use a lizarin or a phthalo. And you rub it into the surface, and then you let it set. And if it's going to destroy the paper, it'll bleed through the other side, and then you'll see it turn yellow. Or you'll get an, an aura around the outside, and then you know that, that once it turns yellow, you know that's going to affect the paper. 
But uh, anyway, this is what they call the Arsh oil. It's brand new. And like I say, you will be getting a sample of that uh, along with a, a variety of other samples that we have there. Now, would that work only with oil or would it work with other, like acrylic? Uh, I haven't tried it with acrylic yet. I was just, when I was testing, I really was trying to make this thing fail. <laughs> you know, let's go. Because acrylic wouldn't hurt it. Uh, and I, uh, my assumption is, yes, it'll work with acrylic. If, it, if it's not going to make the oil paint uh, peel off, acrylic won't work on it. Uh, I have used some watercolor on it because I want to see how absorbent it is. It does have an absorbency because um, I used water mixable oils. And I did a wash just like you would do watercolor. So it's like, okay, it works with that. And that's, I then make the assumption that, yes, it's going to work on a water base. Uh, it's kind of interesting because you're drawing on paper rather than canvas, and it gives a whole different feel to it. In fact, the artists that have tried it go like, wow, this is going to change, give me a whole different look, a whole different style of working. In fact, I'm le uh, in, in some of my paintings, I'm leaving more of the drawing show through because it's not all smeary and stubbly and nasty looking. You can actually get nice rendering. In fact, I just worked on uh, an example this week where I took uh, and did a charcoal drawing and modeled the whole thing in charcoal and then uh, put a fixative on and then glazed over the top of it with the oil. And uh, it's really nice because all your value is right there. It's done. So you can kind of work in different ways and uh, it's kind of interesting, very interesting. But it, it, it's, it, it has a good absorbency, so what happens is some of the, um, the color dries a little faster, just a little bit faster. Uh, but again, as far as versatility and light, and because people, you buy a, uh, people are buying, you know, sheets of paper and gessoing them, and then it's wrinkling all over the place. Uh, now, that comes, it's 22 by 30 sheets and uh, 51 inches by 10 yard rolls right now. It curls, but it goes. It doesn't stay curled. It, it flattens really out. Flattens by itself. It flattens out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's an interesting. I I was at that plein air festival. We were up in, in Red Rock Canyon, and uh, the day we went to pay, you know, Las Vegas. Now, what would you take in your luggage? Shorts, t-shirts. It was 40, 38 degrees with forty mile an hour winds and rain. And the picture I have, I'm hanging on to my easel <laughs> like this, you know, freezing. And I had a leather jacket, the same leather jacket I had, and I had another something else. I put that on, but it was so cold. And here I am working on this paper with water, and I'm thinking, and it's raining. I'm going, it's going to freeze. It's going to freeze on it. I, I didn't try a freeze test, so I thought we'll try it. But it, we had a lot of people working with it. it was, they really enjoyed it. We had a lot of professional painters that just gravitated right to it. Um, and then again, some people grabbed it, did a, a wash uh, with oils, with the water mixable oils, dried, and then started doing figure drawings on it. You know, because it it's, takes a nice mark. It's paper. So, but anyway, we have that for you. And uh, any other questions? What's Ladies first. Upo is uh, also plastic. It's like having mylar, but it's white. It's a white plastic. Uh, so it is not a paper. And so that's why everything's on top. Just, if you took mylar that didn't have an ink, the ink coating on it, like they make it one side and two side. If you take the reverse side of one side, it's very shiny and smooth. And that would act just like Upo. But it's clear. It would take water. Yeah, it would smear around on you because Upo doesn't really take the water in. It doesn't absorb into the surface. Right, but it would, it would dry up. Oh, yeah, yeah. It would bead up. It would sort of bead. Like with Upo, you have that. They, it has the texture is what makes Upo work, okay, that's on there. So you would, uh, but you could take, um, if you want to change the texture of Upo, just spray it with some workable fix of it and you'll get a different texture. Or there's a variety of different things you can experiment with there. Yes, sir? Are you aware of any papers that are, um, I've been using rice paper um, with a lot of acrylic, so it literally just bleeds through it. Uh -huh. Are you aware of any other papers other than rice paper that would actually let it sink in so much it'll go all the way through? Um, 
just like tracing paper, or you can try like the printmaking paper, like Arch 88, which will sink through. That would go right through uh, because you keep adding color in it, it just keeps bleeding through. Yeah. Yes? One of my complaints, uh, I work on um, deckled edge paper because I like the edges, mm -hmm. is the watermarks and the words in the mm -hmm. paper. Mm -hmm. I don't really want it in there. Sorry. <laughs> it's called history. Yeah. Well, actually, a watermark is put in there. One, to, it was. It's. It is traditional. Uh, they put the watermarks in, but it also is a code because it's high price. And the galleries, the museums, look at that. We actually put a code in, so we know if a paper was made today or 20 years ago. Code, uh, really? Yeah, there's a mark in there so that conservators can look at it and say, "Oh, we have this um, Andrew Wyeth." that just surfaced and they look at it and say, but the paper was made in 2010. <laughs> Forgery, click. So it's used in that way today. Years ago it was used so that you knew which side of the paper to use, uh, who made it, what it was used for. So it's kind of a traditional thing on there. But if you're a printer and you have the watermark, then you put a printer's crop in there and you have all these marks on it. It's part of the tradition of it. You just have to work around it. You could so in a roll in a roll it yeah. yeah but I like all decal edges that's why I don't you use the roll yeah. yeah you can create a decal yeah. you can create a decal yeah. what would. are the best pa papers for creating your own decal uh, any of the cotton papers work the best and it's just like in printmaking where you tear the papers I was at this show and we were tearing up um, the Arsh oil paper because we had big sheets and everybody flew in so they wanted little sheets so we took a straight edge and I come, Can you, why don't you just take a knife and cut that? I go, oh, yeah. look how nice this is. And it, it's nothing like tearing cotton paper. You can feel the difference. It just has that smoothness. So if you wet it and tear, you'll get a more of a ragged edge to it on there. So I have a question about paper bleaching. So because uh, uh, I've always been told, I've been doing this for a long time, that uh, any bleached paper like GFK ultimately is going to become closer to the color of like arch cover. Mm -hmm. Do you know, is that true? Uh, I don't think that's true. Because no? one thing is we don't use bleach any, at all. They used to use it years ago, but right. they're not bleached papers. Today, if you want, it's like using an optical brightener to make right. a bright white paper. It, they're going to fail. So and how is it like BFK made white then? Uh, adding pigment. Uh -huh. They add pigment. Now they take the fibers if the, when you and it's made with cotton, so it's a natural right. the natural color. But natural white is not a bright white. No, but if we take and make a bright white, we add pigment in rather than bleach because so titanium white. Yep. Yep. Titanium dioxide. Yeah, because you can add brighteners in or these modern brighteners, right. but it's one of the things that has made a lot of photography fail, right. uh, photographs because the optical brighteners. And the same thing we use in our laundry detergent. It just makes clothes look brighter and whiter, but they burn out. They're like almost like think of pixels on a TV screen. And um, we're all used to cable. If you just hook an antenna to it and watch it and you get interference, the whole TV goes pixelated and you get all these like, crazy dots. And uh, an optical brightener is like having a, all these pixels and they burn out. They go from bright white to gray. And so all of a sudden you start getting these gray spots on the paper and eventually the whole thing goes gray. So they, they, we call them burnout. And so that's, and you can tell when you have them, put a fluorescent light on it. Or not a fluorescent, a black light. And if it fluoresces, then you know they're using optical brighteners in the paper. So but then that also affects the weight of the paper. So a modern 300 gram BFK is not going to be as thick as one from True. two years ago. True, yep. So is this pure white? Does this have the titanium? Yes. Yeah, and today we make a lot of pure white papers or bright white papers because it's di for digital purposes. You photograph them. Because when you print, they'll come out gray or yellow. And so the bright white really helps in that process. So I have another yep, question. go ahead. So years ago there was the Lana Mill, which mm -hmm. acquired, but they closed the Lana Mill. I have a lot of paper okay. there. Then they kept the watermark. I got the, paper, the new paper and it didn't have the same feel. And I know that paper is very water specific, very place specific. It is. 
Yes. And you can't um, Yeah, it's hard when you move a mill from one. That's why they stay where they're at forever. Right. You know, they always said, why does the Arsh mill stay where it's at? Because it's, it's, it's their tradition. It's their water. It's what they use, byproducts. And where we make our other hands-on papers in Anine, um, same thing. But they do make some Arsh papers down there because of the, the kind of the same, same physical things that they have down there. But yeah, that, that was a real cause when, because at one time there were so many mills in France baking paper, or all over Europe, and then all of a sudden now they're down to small numbers, and they start consolidating them together. And it makes, it makes a difference. It does make a difference. And you will see changes. I mean, changes happen because of, you know, the cotton. You know, was it a good year? Was it a bad year? Um, you know, what happens with some of the the ingredients that go into it, you know, the difference in hide glue, how they make gelatin today compared to when they made it years ago. Uh, you know, we're not using rabbit skin glue anymore. You know, you'll notice with Arsh papers that you don't get that really, really nasty smell. I found a box of paper that's like, of Arsh, Arsh paper that probably is 25 years old, probably older than that, probably almost 30 years old. And I go, oh, I found this, I popped it open, and it was like, oh, geez, something died in there. I mean, because it was, it was all that high glue, just like, <laughs> um, and because that's what it's made from. But today you'll see that it doesn't have that. It still has a smell when you wet it, but it's not as like it used to be. It was really, it used to be nasty. But, uh, so they change ingredients, and it depends on what's available, you know, what you can get uh, out there. So you will see changes. Always. So high glue is now made from? They still use a, an animal glue, but it's just not processed the same way. It's actually more refined. Do you know what animal? No. No. Probably roadkill. <laughs> <laughs> don't hold me to that. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not roadkill. I don't know what they use. But there's still a lot of processing being done, and uh, some gelatins... Uh, and I'm not, I don't know for sure, but some gelatins come from uh, even vegetable type products. They make gelatins from seaweed. Agar. Yeah, agar. And they become kind of a gelatin substance. You know, a lot of times though, these things are all real, real proprietary because they don't answer all my questions. <laughs> and no paper mill will because it's, that's the, we always call it the secret sauce. What, what makes that paper, that paper is what they use to make it. And so they're not going to give that up because then 20 other mills can make the same thing. So it takes away from that. So. Okay, what about um, lessening the um, footprint, carbon footprint, and going recycle with some of these? Or recycle, okay. Like yeah. That? Recycle doesn't always reduce your carbon footprint. Right. Well, because what you're doing is you've got to take all that paper and clean it up. So that. Probably cost just, it used to cost just as much or more to make recycled paper than it did regular paper. It also makes a very terrible paper. It's good for, you know, packaging, things like that. And art papers, no. Uh, for printmaking, never, because the fibers are so short. You push that plate right, your matrix right through it. Um, and that's why you'll see in art papers, and we do make recycled papers, but it's always like 30%. What about it's not a full 100%. Um, that I don't know, because we, we buy our cotton from cotton processors, you know, across Tennessee, Texas, Arkansas. It's like one of the highest pesticide products in the world. Oh, yeah. 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 Which could be good for the paper. Why? Keeps the bugs away from it. We have to put less of the bug juice in, as we call it. Because <laughs> we do have to put ingredients in. Because when you're storing paper in a warehouse, you know, it's just wrapped in wrappings and things get to it. Or in storage, you know, museums, things like that. There's a lot of paper around. But uh, we try, we have a whole series of, um, of these, what do we call them, these uh, eco-pledges. We have like six or seven of them um, that we, we stand by. And we have for a long time. It's so one of the things about making paper in Europe. They were very, they're more eco-friendly than we ever were because they're such small communities and they're tight-knit and they have to be that way. 
So when you go to the paper mill, the water that comes out is actually cleaner than the water that goes in. Okay, you can go there, and when they're making black paper, you get that black liquor and all that really nasty stuff. They clean that up. You could turn that faucet on and actually drink that water after it comes out. That's how clean it is. It's very, very pure. And that's one of the things about giving back. We have to, we have to do that. You just, we can destroy it. Rivers, and that's, we know. <laughs> Being in a paper area, or go to Georgia. <laughs> uh, pretty nasty smells down there. But you have to do that. So we look at different ways of always um, working. And so we put the eco pledges right on our, on our surfaces. And there's different ones. We have about seven of them that I can't recite them. It's like the Ten Commandments, you know, <laughs> paper making. But you have to do that as you're going through very socially conscious. We want to make the world beautiful, but we want to keep it. <laughs> yes? Could you uh, talk a little bit about storage um, of paper and also shipping, whether it's really a cardinal sin to roll it? Um, in storing paper, it's very important because, and I should have mentioned this earlier, when you buy paper, it's acid free. Will it stay acid free? Not necessarily. Because remember, I'm talking about the Matisse when, or you know, Matisse or Cezanne, one of them, one of them guys, uh, where you acid migrate it. Well, the same thing could happen um, when you store paper. If you store it uh, in a wooden cabinet, it's going to acquire acid over a period of time. Um, that's why I say you always have to, you know, watch how you store your paper. If you get the plastic bags that ship paper sheets are shipped in, use them. Prints printmaking paper. I store all my paper back in those plastic bags. Go to an art store and say, geez, don't throw those out, save them. You're, first of all, you're recycling the plastic. Uh, it's not going to go offshore, and it's serving a really good function. You're storing your paper, because that is inert. The plastic is inert. Um, when you're framing, everything that touches your paper should be acid-free. Okay, so when you have a mat board, um, you know, we buy mat boards, and again, we, it turns yellow around the edge. That's not acid-free, because it wouldn't turn yellow. Everything that touches it, even putting acid-free tape around the outside. People that tape on it, they'll put tape down, like on this. Put tape down on here, and they leave it on. It depends on the tape. will leave a residue. That, that residue will actually cause the paper to turn yellow. It's acidic. I was at the National Gallery in Washington. They had volunteers in there. All these drawings they get, people send them uh, artwork, tons of stuff. They had crews just pulling tape off of items. Um, I mean, I framed. I used to see good pieces of artwork come in that were masking tape onto a backing board, and we'd have to release that. You can release it, but it leaves a residue, and that residue is going to cause that paper to deteriorate over a period of time. So you always have to be kind of really cautious as to what you use. So art, the acid-free artist tape are great for that. So when I would frame, I would take the piece, all the glass, the back board, the backing board, everything, and then put acid-free tape around the edge. And then now you create an environment for that paper to exist. Okay. Uh, is it going to stay in that frame forever? No. It'll be reframed and then done archivally over and over again. Glass won't affect it. Glass is inert. It's acid-free. It's neutral. Do you bury your paper or pull somebody from the silverfoil? Yeah, but you always have to, even with coating a backing board, um, acid, get, acid is a vapor. It can, my, it can get through places you can't imagine. So, yes, it'll... It'll work for a period of time, but how long? It's better to be safe than not so safe. But uh, they, they, that's why glassine is good, because it is inert. It's, and that's what you use in all the museums and when you're curating prints, lots of that to, to hold, it, hold it together. But storing is very important. Uh, rolling? Rolling shouldn't be a problem. It depends on the medium. You yeah. know, if I'm rolling um, a gouache, drawing that has gouache on it, then be very careful because the gouache is probably going to pop off. If it's not, depends on the layer. Um, acrylic, 
is okay if you got acrylic on there, but if it gets really, really cold, somebody hits it, it's gonna crack the acrylic. Won't hurt the paper, but it'll crack the acrylic. Uh, oil on paper, once it gets to a certain stage, it's gonna get brittle. You can roll it, it, it's gonna pop off, it'll break. Just like you're rolling a canvas. So you have to really always think of the medium that you're using. Yes? I just want to add to that, but I, I think when you are rolling, because you're rolling paint, that it's better to roll oh, yes. out, have it be on the outside, yes. so that if it does crack, then you unroll it, mm -hmm. and it you know, still holds on to the paper rather than break off. Sure, exactly. Yeah, we always roll artwork out. When you're shipping pieces, uh, be careful what's packed against it. I always like to create a carton within a carton so that the drawing is either spooled tight and then a box around that. And, you know, have a box and then put basically, it depends, you know, on, on the price. I put foam around the outside. Um, even when I had prints shipped, uh, Boston Printmakers, we had the art show. I, I always purchase items and I, they ship them to me and they do a great job at shipping. I mean, it comes in a box, inside of a box, <laughs> and it's wrapping around it, and guess what? I open it up, and I know everything's going to be intact. Um, I had a painting shipped from Europe one time. It was like, it was like $900, and I'm thinking, well, I could get this thing home, and it could be like little bitty pieces in the bottom of the box. But they did a, they did a fair job with it. And if you've ever tried to ship artwork, and you go to a UPS store or something like that, and you say it's artwork, they won't, they won't even touch it. They have to have at least three to four inches of space around the artwork. So if you come in with it, they will insist, no, we will not insure it, um, or we won't even ship it. We, they will want to repack it. And sometimes we feel like we're getting ripped off because they just want to make money. But it's really, they're protecting that piece. I can't imagine when like the Met in New York ships, or the Louvre ships things from one country to another. <laughs> that would be, whew, I wouldn't want that insurance company's bill. I'm surprised to hear you say that you would put something in glass, put paper in plastic. I would think that would make a nice moisture in there. No, not really. If it's, I mean, you're storing it in, uh, in an area that's, of course, no moisture. Uh, but if uh, if, the, if there is moisture and the paper is in a plastic and sealed, then the moisture can't get to the paper, so it actually acts as a barrier. Yeah. Yeah. But it's better than put it in between butcher paper, whatever kind of paper you have, wrapping paper. Uh, then uh, one of the things that always drives me nuts when I go to the bookstores, especially college students running around with these cardboard portfolios that are basically cardboard boxes, and they're, you know, going in and they buy their BFK and their Arsh and Fabriano cotton papers and they put it in this cardboard and you know darn well it's going to get stored in there. When they get out of school, it's going to be stored in there forever um, until mom throws it out or they decide to do something with it. But, you know, it's going to kill the paper. So even old portfolios, I've taken the old portfolios and basically used those, but put the paper in plastic and I slide it in my old portfolios. And I've stored, my portfolios have been in a garage probably for 20 years, and that paper is still, is, in fact, I found a whole package, 25 sheets of DFK just recently, I uncovered, and I go, wow, gold, you know, and paper was perfect. Still in plastic, but it was in, in one of these nice black portfolios and it was stored in the garage. So they hold up as long as, I mean, if it got flooded, that would be a different story. <laughs> then I would have a problem. Then I would, I, what would I do? I'd make paper out of it. <laughs> it's one thing you could do with pa old paper, is make paper. And I encourage students, you know, when I'm lecturing, I lecture a lot of college classes, and I said, you know, don't throw all your paper away. You know, take it, put it in your blender, you know, Get some Knox gelatin, you know, make yourself some paper and make a project out of it. Add it into a piece of artwork. We call it mixed media today, but uh, it, it works. Any other questions? I'm getting tired. <laughs> I get in at midnight last night, flying in. 
I was supposed to fly at eight in the I was supposed to take off from Chicago at eight in the morning. When I looked at my thing, it says eight p.m. I go, boy, that's an hour. <laughs> that's what happens when you travel too much. So I said, okay, I'll get here at oh, eleven thirty. So then it was like up early this morning. So I was like, I'll sleep with you. <laughs> that's just for perils of travel. We have some samples over here for you. Uh, please, if you have any questions, you can ask me. I thank you very much for your time, your patience, your questions. And if you ever have any questions, I know we have some professors here. If you ever want me to come and talk to your classes, and, or you can do it. <laughs> I'm available. I'm available. I get out here, oh, well, since South Valley.